Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for the final session of Regional Outlook Forum 2020. Session 5 will discuss Beyond the Horizon, Pakatan Harapan's succession plans and economic challenges. This session will be moderated by Dr. Francis Hutchinson, Senior Fellow and Coordinator of Malaysia Studies Program at Isis Yusuf Ishak Institute. Joining the panel are Mr. Rafizi Ramli and Dr. Nung Sari Ahmad Radi. Dr. Hutchinson, please. Thank you very much. So we all follow events in Malaysia closely. And after the seismic changes of May 2018, 2019 was the year that the country's voters expected the new administration to enact changes. Some key reforms have been implemented, such as lowering the voting age from 21 to 18, gradually lifting the minimum wage, and reviewing and renegotiating large-scale uh, construction projects. Nevertheless, surveys consistently indicate worries about cost of living issues, as well as growing impatience with the pace of reform. Following a run of by-election victories in 2018, the tide turned against Pakatan Harapan in 2019 with a series of losses, most notably in Tanjung Pi in November in the wake of the cooperation pact between UMNO and PAS. This year will be crucial for Pakatan Harapan as we approach their second anniversary in May and indeed the halfway mark in November. And while economic forecasts for the country are reasonably positive, voters are demanding tangible improvements in their daily lives. And global attention will be on the country as it hosts the APEC meetings. And the question looming on the minds of all of us is when and how the leadership transition will take place. To equip us to analyze the year ahead, we are lucky to have two very knowledgeable commentators on the Malaysian political and economic contest. The first to my right is Rafizi Ramli, who is Vice President of Parti Kiadilan Rakya and former Member of Parliament for Pandan. YB Rafizi has qualifications in engineering and accounting and has occupied senior positions in the corporate world, in co including in Petronas. He founded the data analytics firm Invoke, which is credited with being one of, if not the only firm, to correctly call the 2018 election. Our second speaker on my left is Dr. Nungsari Radi, who is the chairman of the board of trustees of the Kazana Research Institute and the executive chairman of the Malaysian Aviation Commission. He has a PhD in economics from Purdue University and has served in senior level positions in various GLCs, including Kazana Nacional. He has also uh, been active in politics and was a member of parliament for Balik Pulau in Penang a few years ago. So each of our speakers has 25 minutes after which we will proceed to Q&A. With this, if I can please invite YB Rafizi to take the floor. Good evening. Thank you, Francis. Um, thanks to ICS for having us. Um, I have a big challenge to speak at four o'clock because I have to compete with your desire to leave early to beat the rush hours and also an overload of one whole day of the mass created by politicians. Um, I have about 25 minutes. Um, and is that 24 minutes now? Um, let me start with a recap. Um, about 18 months ago, uh, Malaysians did the unthinkable, or at least what the world thought unthinkable then. Um, we ended a one-party rule, which at that time was the longest-running one-party rule in the world after 60-plus years without a single drop of blood. And um, I spent the last 20 years from being a, a student activist into a party leader. And I've toured the country for a decade campaigning for change. And the biggest fear then was change was not possible. Um, if there was a change, it would be chaos. So it has been an 18 month of roller coaster. We started off, um, with a high euphoria. The approval rating for the government was high 80s in the first few months of the election. 18 months later, 
the approval rating for this government is as low as Najib's government. It's, it's in, in the 30s. Then, of course, this exacerbates the one question that has been um, on everyone's mind in Malaysia and, and with regionally and also in the international, especially investment community, which is the leadership succession issue. If in the aftermath of general election, um, Mahathir was credited for winning the election for Pakatan, with what had happened in the last 18 months, more and more of Pakatan leaders and, and Pakatan supporters feel that Anwar Ibrahim would be a better bet going into the next general election if Pakatan were to be uh, a government of more than one term. I also have to recap the arrangement for leadership succession. Um, I happen to be the person who drafted and negotiated that agreement. Um, had been there from day one, going to and through between Mahathir and, and Anwar. To cut the long story short, because it was a long story, the consensus reached at the Presidential Council of Pakatan Harapan was that for Mahathir to be named as the seventh Prime Minister candidate prior to the election, it has to come with a package. And there were three conditions in the package. Number one is the leadership succession, that Mahathir were to be named as the seventh Prime Minister candidate, with should um, Pakatan Harapan uh, win the last general election, Anwar were to be given a royal pardon so that he could take immediate role in politics. Um, the second condition was that um, the announcements has to be made together with the conclusion of the seat allocation negotiation. And the third condition was that the, the four parties must agree to a policy platform um, prior to the announcements. That was the announcements and agreement that was done on 7th of January 2018 that, that had been referred to as the agreement. Of course, the agreement did not specifically mention a date. From the first draft that I drafted, there was never a mention of a date. Um, to the public announcements that was read during the announcements on 7th of January 2018, there was no reference to any date. But Mahathir himself had repeatedly within the meeting and outside the meeting and publicly had referred to a two-year timeline. And, and, and I suppose that's why the question of whether or not it's going to take place is getting more uh, loud now that we are getting a few months before that two-year timeline. Um, while it resolved the problem of leadership going into the last general election, this, this arrangement of, of leadership succession had brought a different set of problems for Malaysia in the last 18 months, especially um, the country was kind of stuck in the interim period, and I, I, I've withdrawn fully from politics in, since the last few months. And, you know, I'm, I'm in the business now. I, I, I went back to a private life. And I can understand, looking from the outside, how that arrangement uh, suspended the country in the interim period. Because if I were an investor, I don't actually know whether or not whatever this government is working now is going to stay for another year, two years, because it's quite normal that when a new leadership comes in, he or she will bring in a new suit of, of, of policies and focus. Given this background, um, anywhere I suppose you go in Malaysia, um, at least in the, among the decision makers, the top three questions have always been, number one, whether or not the succession or the transition will take place. Is Mahathir going to hand over to Anwar as promised to the voters before the election? Number two, 
if that is going to happen, when is it going to happen? Because we've seen changing goalposts from a short time to two years to maybe three years. Um, so, so this uncertainty creates um, more uncertainties at a time when uh, the government is not seen to be performing up to the expectation of the voters. And of course, the third question is, as Francis has pointed out just now, given the um, change of sentiment the last 18 months had seen, whether or not Pakatan will be a one-term government, can Pakatan win the next general election? Let me start with um, the most crucial question first, which is succession. The new indicative date that is bandied about now is after APEC, which is after November 2020. This was a public st statement that was done by the Prime Minister. Um, there was no definitive date when exactly is after APEC. Is it going to be first quarter of 2021? Is it going to be one month before the next general election? So it, it remains hanging. But I think it was an indication from Mahade that he is not agreeable to the two-year timeline. So um, to me, it's, it's a quite straightforward um, answer that he will not relinquish in May 2020. Um, the kind of... Uh, for us to be able to decide whether it's going to be in May or whether it's going to be next year or 2022, we need to understand that the succession question is going to be decided by about 130 people. So while the rest of the world and 30 million Malaysians can continue to watch, it will be a decision by about 130 people, which is about 120-ish government MPs and about the 10 people who sit in the Pakatan Leadership Presidential Council. Um, there are only two decisions that can affect a leadership change. First, if the, president, the Pakatan's Presidential Council makes a decision that defines and name a date for the transition to happen. Of course, it's also subject to how Mahade reacts to that. If tomorrow, for example, Pakatan Harapan's Presidential Council decides a date and imposes a date, uh, we don't know how Mahathir will react to it. Is he going to accept it? Is he not going to accept it? But it has to start from the Pakatan Harapan's Presidential Council. So that's one function. The other function, of course, is the number of MPs, whether or not Anwar or Mahathir command enough MPs in Parliament. So let's deal with the first one, whether Pakatan Harapan Presidential Council will impose the date. Um, at some point, I think they will, but I don't think they are in the mood to rock the boat, especially given the um, public sentiment against the government, the all-time low approval rating. Um, and if you have met enough politicians, you know that um, politicians are an, uh, a, a creature of the bell curve. You know, you have the ones who are daring at the one extreme, you have the ones who are extremely coward at the um, uh, other extreme, but the majority of the bell curve is wait and see, they will jump to the boat which wins. So rocking the boat is not a politician's uh, game play, they are very risk averse. Given that the sentiment has turned against Pakatan, uh, I doubt that many MPs, more so the leadership of the four parties, would want to rock the boat. Um, my reading is that DAP as a party favours um, uh, a timeline after APEC. Um, I suppose the thinking is, is to avoid um, a clash or confrontation with Mahade because it is important to make sure if transition were to take place, it has to be smoothed and it cannot be um, imposed. 
Um, <clears throat> and uh, it is unlikely that Amanah is going to, to rock the boat either, especially because they are the smallest party and they are the most jittery when it comes to seats. So given that the coalition has four parties, you have PKR, you have um, PPBM, which is Mahadev's party, and you have DAP and you have Amana, and PKR and PPBM are interested parties. So it's, it's, if there is a move, most probably the move would have to come from neutral party, which is either uh, DAP or Amana, and it is unlikely that they are going to impose any date soon. When it comes to the number of MPs, um, I think it's a common knowledge from a simple arithmetic for those who follow Malaysian politics that Anwar does have the number. Um, from the simple fact that PKR commands the most number of MPs at 50, um, and then you have the AP at 42, so PKR and the AP commands um, the largest block in parliament, 92 out of the simple majority of 111. Even if you discount two or three renegades MPs, and I think by now it's quite obvious that even if there are MPs who will not vote for Anwar, um, should there is a count in, in parliament, the number does not exceed five. So by and large, Anwar's block of support among the MPs is, is quite solid in Parliament. However, although Anwar commands the number, I don't think that it will ever come to the count of individual MPs because if this government has to push through a vote of no confidence against its own Prime Minister, the whole thing will collapse. So while the number is there, uh, it is as good as quite useless as far as the transition is concerned because if Anwar resorts to using a vote of no confidence against his own prime minister, the whole coalition most probably will collapse and the new government that takes place will be a hybrid or a mixture of government one way or another. It's not in the current form. So given that, I think... Um, you will, I, I doubt that there will be any bold attempt to push for transition this year. When Mahade has made it clear that he is looking after APEC, I think the leadership of Pakatan will actually toe the line. Not so much because of um, what they feel about Mahade, but mostly I think because it's common sense that you, if, if you're talking about a few months, you may not want to rock the boat given the sensitivity outside. Um, of course, there are detractors within the government who would continue to pester that Mahathir serve a full term, but I think they are a small minority. And um, while there is a thought within the government that Mahathir can drag the transition beyond 2020 into the 2021, hoping that um, the one year will be enough before Najib and Zahid to go to prison and Najib and Zahid going to prison will create a vacuum from which a realignment between PPBM and AMNO can be forged. Uh, because there's always been that attempt trying to forge the AMNO and PPBM uh, together to form a bigger number. While I am aware of that school of thoughts in a small minority of the government. Um, I don't think it is that simple to pull off because a few things are, are against that plan. Um, number one, given the advanced age of Mahade, 95 going to 96, and then um, the government is struggling with the perceived let last the performance and um, the public will not tolerate much focus on power struggle. And the fact that at the end of the day, Anwar still holds the card because he has the largest MP block. So my gut feeling is the transition most probably will take place in the first half of 2021. Um, because um, if there is no definitive answer after APEC 2020, November 2020, if 
either Mahathir or Pakatan Harapan's leadership still dilly-dally about a definitive transition date, um, I think the grassroots of Pakatan and the country will lose patience and, and the public pressure will mount that that will be the time, the turning point when Pakatan Harapan's leadership, the four parties' leaders, will have to impose a date on, on Mahathir. So, um, but I, I don't think it will happen this year. Most probably it will happen in the first half of next year. Um, so that's, I think, the first two questions answered. Whether there will be a transition, and if there is a transition, when that transition is going to happen. So I have about seven minutes to um, cover the last one, which is, is this government going to last longer than one term? What will happen given the trajectory and and um, if you follow what happens in Malaysia, um, the last one year has seen extreme deterioration in uh, multiculturalism. Uh, there has been a lurch to right-wing um, Malay, Islam, political axis. Um, if there is an election today, given all the numbers, um, the opposition, UMNO and PAS combined, should be able to form a simple majority government. Um, so, having said that, I was faced with the same question in 2016. At that time, um, uh, Najib was embroiled with the 1MDB scandal. Um, the opposition coalition then had just broken down. Um, PAS had just uh, walked out, we just launched Pakatan Harapan, the current government, and um, we had to cobble together the previous past leaders to form Amana. So in June 2016, July 2016, um, if I were to ask the question, would Pakatan Harapan win the 14th general election, you know, I wouldn't be so bold to say we would. The whole country thought that it was hopeless, all is gone. When Najib was at the weakest, the opposition was in shambles. That point of time always served me as a reminder of the kind of time that you need to turn around a political crisis in today's world, with the social media, with the Facebook streaming, with more and more people having access to every single thing that politicians do, um, two years is perhaps just enough, the right time that you need in order to turn around a political crisis. So although at this point, if election were to be called, um, Amno and PAS will come back to power. Well, PAS will come to power, Amno, Amno will back, come back to power and PAS will be in power for the first time. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion. Um, things remain extremely fluid between now and 2023 because this government has three years to go. Um, what we can expect is Amno and PAS will continue to play the race-religion narrative to the maximum. Um, it's a bit sad, um, but I think it's also uh, the rite of passage that Malaysians as a multiracial society has to go through. Um, it's very difficult to be a, a, a Malay politician in Malaysia now if you are part of government because you are seen as a sellout to the non-Malays and the balance is as such that there are 65% Malays, 35% non-Malays. However, I still think that the next general election will be decided by the economy and the bread and butter. When Francis pointed out that, you know, I, I, I was talking about Pakatan Harapan would win the last general election from as early as 2017. Most people thought that I was crazy. Uh, the reason being was quite simple. If you look at the demography of Malaysia, you would see a pattern. Number one, the government has always been formed by the parties that won Peninsula Malaysia. And there are 165 seats in Peninsula Malaysia. Out of that 165 seats, there are 40 seats which are almost foregone conclusion will not be won by UMNO because it's a majority non-Malay seats. It's, it's a PKR or DAP seats and most of these seats are urban seats. 
There are the other extreme, 70 seats, which are Malay majority seats with more than 70% Malay voters. It's a foregone conclusion, Pakatan will not win the seats. So the battle for the government of Malaysia is usually decided by about 50 mixed semi-urban seats. And, and, and usually this, this has about 60 to 70% Malay voters and 30% and above non-Malay voters. And it's usually semi-urban or urban seats. We won the last general election because we won the marginal 40 seats which form these mixed majority seats. And if you look at their demography, you know that they are economic voters. Whether they are Malays, Chinese or Indians, they are basically living, they live on the fringe of city and urban centers. They are the ones who are most affected by the bread and butter issues. Um, which means that if transition were to take place in the first half of 2021, and Anwar does take over within a year, time-wise, there is enough time to turn things around, provided Anwar can put together a credible economic team. It all will be decided by how Anwar can deliver in that two years. Two years is enough. What I'm not sure now is whether or not Anwar will be radical enough to put aside all the lobby and all the vested interests, inter and intra party, to put a professional and credible cabinet members who can convince the public that things will get better. If he can do that, and he focus on a strong economic delivery, he focus on and he demonstrate early success in addressing some of the key pain points in the economy. Number one, the underemployment, and number two, the low wages. And also, if he can articulate convincingly in that two years, a pathway to high income economy, uh, then within two years, it is enough time to turn around the public sentiment and win the mid seats because although those mid seats are still Malay majority seats, a lot of the voters are actually economic voters who will vote depending on how the economy is. So to conclude, I have about 50 seconds. Um, first question, I don't think transition will take place this year. Transition most probably will take place in the first half of next year. If there is no definitive answer from Mahade, most probably the date will be imposed by Pakatan by then. And number two, well, that, that answers question, first question, second question. And the last question is, uh, you know, it's, it remains to be seen whether or not um, this government will win the next general election. I don't think it's too late. My bigger concern is not too much about the lurch to the right wing um, ethnic religious narratives of the opposition. My biggest concern is whether or not this government or when Anwar comes to uh, the premiership, whether he can be radical and creative enough to grapple with the challenges of this economy because that's actually a lot more difficult than the succession planning itself. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, YB, for that very insightful uh, presentation. With this, if I can invite Dr. Nulungsari to take the stand. Thank you, Francis. And thank you, Isis, for having me. I'll, I'll put on, after that, I'll have to put on the... Uh, a purely uh, economic policy uh, person, uh, looking at both the, the political and as well as the economic uh, situation in Malaysia, I'll follow quite uh, strictly what I've circulated uh, to the organizers. There's one sheet, uh, three points, and three points within each of the three points, the nine points, and first touching on the political dynamics, uh, and secondly on the economy, uh, and then thirdly on the outlook uh, on uncertainties and possible upsides. Now, I'll have to start with the political side because I think, uh, the, mindful of what uh, Rafiji have just said, I think the political dynamic is such that from an observer who's not inside the game, it is still equilibrating, it is still looking for, for, for a landing. And uh, it partly has to do with 
there's all multiple transitions going on, and uh, a lot of these multiple transitions, and one of which is actually the section which I won't touch on, which is really based on the question of trust. Now, people need to be reminded that actually uh, there's not just succession in the political sense within the coalition, but also there's a transition uh, of having uh, a new government working with an old, not an old, working with a, a bureaucracy, a civil service, which is not used to working with a, a new government. So that's also a major transition that's going on, uh, apart from the transition within the ruling coalition itself. And that has created, I think, quite a bit of uh, uh, terms like, uh, you know, deep state, uh, sabotage and things of that sort. So when a country goes through a change of this sort, uh, uh, one of the things that is uh, not given enough credence is actually how the political class, the new political class, perhaps elected on a populist platform, is going to work uh, with the bureaucracy and the laws and, uh, that's already in place. And sometimes those two uh, would clash. In Malaysia, there's also the issue of a federal and state. People tend to forget uh, Malaysia is actually a federation, a federation of 13 states and one federal territory. Uh, but even that statement uh, can be contested because uh, people are saying maybe it's not a federation of 13 states, it's a federation of three entities. So the Sabah, Sarawak says uh, Sabah and Sarawak got, got together with Malaya to form, and Singapore at the time, <laughs> to form what, is, what was Malaysia, what is now Malaysia. So this whole business about um, a federal state relationships, uh, centralization, decentralization, and that, those sort of things are also uh, crucial because it has a bearing on, on, on intergovernmental relations. It has a bearing on uh, a fiscal uh, centralization or decentralization, and how do you manage power between the center and uh, the states, notwithstanding the constitution has already defined some of those things. So those. Uh, issues are actually uh, quite uh, quite serious. The things that we have to give credit to the new government is actually some of the stuff on, on, on governance, some of the stuff on uh, the judiciary, some of the stuff on clearly on, on freedom, on, on press freedom and freedom of, the, of uh, association and speech and so on has actually moved on, which actually have made the, sit the situation more difficult for everybody. So that's, that's uh, one of those things, but the point is, uh, the political dynamic is still uh, equilibrating. Uh, the second bit on that is actually one of the reasons, one of the things that people are looking towards but uh, doesn't seem to find, despite the fact that the Pakatan Harapan has already had this manifesto, is actually uh, they're not clear um, uh, what is the narrative, or, or rather there was a narrative and it got clouded. So what, what is the narrative here? What is the what is the, the whole raison d'etre of this government? And how is it different from uh, the previous government? Is it, is it ideological? Is it class-based? Certainly it wasn't class-based. Is it, is it race? Uh, is it regional? What is it? Are we, are we going to be more, uh, a more visible hand of the state or more uh, market uh, dependent? So those sort of things are, are somewhat cloudy, and uh, when and that when you intersperse those things with uh, narratives like uh, uh, new and old, right? So people, some people say, "Oh, new Malaysia," and then, and then people say, some old people will say, "You know, I thought Malaysia was Malaysia got get independence in 1957 and not uh, May 2018." Then you get into all this very unproductive discussion of old and new, uh, of, of, of right and wrong, and of the past and the future, and the, the future therefore becomes not so clear. Then what should be the narrative? Should it be about growth and the resulting and serious issue of inequality that we have in the country? Or is it about identity politics? And it's increasingly, the identity bit has actually dominated the the discussion to the point that actually uh, some of the bread and butter issues are, are, are being sidelined. So the government came out with this thing called uh, uh, SPV 2030, uh, quite a while after got, uh, getting elected. That hasn't gotten the kind of traction that, say, uh, 
National Development uh, Policy 1990 or New Economic Policy 1970 or even phrases like Malaysia Inc. or uh, uh, some of the new initiatives that was introduced in the past. So then people have a sense that maybe there is a lack of coherence within the government itself that it cannot speak in one voice and uh, tell the, uh, the, the people and the investors and everybody that this is the story that we're going towards. And what it does is actually people are looking from the point of view of to what extent do you want to reform and do the hard things and uh, on one end, and the other end is you have to do the right things. Right? There's, there's something between fulfilling the political imperatives of being uh, popular and there's the more difficult thing of trying to do the difficult things, which is politically possibly unpopular. And, and those uh, sort of things, if I were doing uh, political economic risk assessment, I would be looking at whether people are doing, uh, the government is doing those things. Now, the second bit, more on the economy, uh, uh, by the, by the gov government's budget for 2020, basically, uh, is saying that actually there's a lot of headwinds. Uh, so we, we're looking at uh, 2020 uh, with third year running of below 5% growth. Um, I know that growth rates are not everything, but at least just to, to have a sense of uh, the pulse of the economy. <clears throat> now, uh, that's just fine to me. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those economists. I'm a microeconomist, so I'm not too hung up on one of these big macro numbers. Uh, it is more of uh, what comprises the growth and the quality of the growth is perhaps more important than actually the actual uh, measure of the growth. So in that sense, I think the... Uh, the Ministry of Finance have done a very decent job in actually putting some discipline and managing the, the fiscal constraint and so on. But the more worrying part of that big uh, picture is actually uh, 2020 is, is expected to be driven yet again by uh, private investments. Uh, I think they're expecting, they're putting a number 4.8% uh, overall growth and uh, private investment uh, driving it at about 9 over percent growth. That to me is the, the worrying part because um, while private investment has actually been driving growth, uh, that is not sustainable because you know, levels of household indebtedness and you can't expect people to spend when the mood is not there and the sentiments are not there. So that's one of the worrying part. The other bits is actually, if you look at uh, capital, if you look at uh, the role of capital or investments or you know, you can look at uh, you know, incremental capital output ratio measures, or you can look at accumulation of uh, uh, capital, uh, it's not there. And that's the, w the worrying part. You, know, you have to invest uh, in, in new capacities to generate uh, future growth. So that's another big concern. Uh, although uh, we've seen some in 2019, late 2018, we saw a bit of a euphoria, uh, expectation of that but it sort of died off, but hopefully it can still continue. Now, capital is again important because uh, although Malaysia has been a uh, uh, capital surplus economy for the longest time, since, since 1999, like that, uh, uh, the current account actually has shrunk quite a bit. It was, say, 10 years ago, it was in the double digit as a percentage of, of, of GDP, and it's now in the very low uh, below 5%, 2 3% of GDP. So that says something about the supply of capital, which actually is necessary in order to fuel or to, to finance the, def the deficits. But more than that, it's actually to, to finance the investments uh, in new capacities that, that's, that's needed. But the most worrying part of the economy is actually about youth and, and youth uh, unemployment and the inequalities uh, uh, that lies within that. I think Rafizi has mentioned about uh, under underemployment, the official numbers for unemployment rate is quite low, below below four, but the unemployment uh, among those within, say, uh, 19, 18 to 25 is actually very high. And that, that just shows you that the economy is not generating uh, jobs or the kind of jobs to absorb this, this sort of uh, numbers. I think uh, somebody, Marie, uh, mentioned what, two million. So Malaysia needs to about 400,000 jobs 300, 4,000, 100,000 jobs a year, and that's just not, not, not coming through. And this is the kind of uh, uh, social time bombs 
that we need to address. Uh, otherwise, a whole slew of uh, 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 people in, I mean, the, uh, Malaysia's demographic is quite young uh, in, in the sense that I think about 60% are under 25. Less than that, six, uh, but almost there is, uh, less than 25. So actually, and uh, uh, the, the government has decided to give 18-year-olds uh, uh, the right to vote in the next election. So if they don't address this issue of uh, job creation, which has to do with how capital owners are willing to put capital uh, in things, then this business about uh, uh, um, uh, youth and unemployment and inequality will get, will get worse. One of the things that is quite telling, actually, uh, the, 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 the level of household uh, indebtedness and household debt is, is about 80% of GDP, which is quite, quite, quite sizable. But if you talk to somebody from the central bank, they'll say, actually, there's money, monetary stability there because uh, the total financial assets by household is two and a half times that debt. So when you have uh, household assets, financial assets, huh, just financial assets, two and a half times the total uh, household debt, at that level, you think you're all covered lah, because you have two and a half times financial assets, which should be liquid to cover the, the debts. But this, that tells you that actually the inequality is so bad that you know where the debt is from and you know who owns the asset. So this is the kind of disparity uh, that is a slowly ticking time bomb if we don't address the issue of growth and, uh, uh, and, and employment creation. The, 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 the one good thing, and I'll say this, that Najib has done was actually the GST. Uh, PH might disagree with me, but uh, because what the GST did was it actually formalized a big part of the economy. It formalized every part of the economy because the way the GST is structured, everybody is revealed. Right? So what has happened before that? Was we had a sizable, uh, for an economy the level of Malaysia, uh, sizable, uh, not informal sector, but informal in the sense that they're not part of the system. So the GST actually you know, uh, cleared this thing up. And, but now you have this SST, but you have this proliferation of uh, underemployment and um, the so-called gig, gig economy, uh, where social safety nets, uh, by way of uh, provident funds or, or so, uh, uh, accidents, uh, occupational hazard and all this stuff are not there. So we need to think seriously about that. That's one. The second bit on the economy is actually the domestication of the economy. Malaysia, uh, at, the big, at the turn of the century, only in 1999, 2000, if you add the total uh, value of exports and total value of imports, it's 200 times, uh, it's twice the size of the GDP. It's something like what Singapore is in some sense. The total value of exports and total value of uh, imports is twice the size of uh, 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 the GDP. Of course, a lot of the exports has a lot of import content as well. But the point is, it's a trading, na it's a trading nation, it's an open uh, economy. Now, that proportion, that ratio is down to about 120%. That means it's really 1.2 times, uh, total trade is 1.2 times GDP. So the economy is domesticating. Uh, and it's domesticating by enlarging the services sector as opposed to domesticating by enlarging the manufacturing sector, which then explains why uh, income is kind of, kind of uh, uh, low. And this is a, 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 a something that we have to think very seriously about because if the country cannot find new, new things to do other than what Rafizi was involved in the past in oil and gas, uh, palm oil, rubber, and if we cannot find anything else other than those things, I think we are, we are, we are in bad shape actually. Because uh, and then the, the the other engine is actually FDI-based manufacturing, but FDI-based manufacturing is getting to be narrower and narrower in terms of what's going on uh, elsewhere. I'm from Penang. Uh, the the ENE uh, in Penang uh, is mainly not in the new ENE, right? They're not in the mobile devices, flexible boards and things like that, they are more the old stuff, like you know, hard, hard drives and things of that sort. So that's the thing. We need to find new, new things. Um, 
there's a lot of new, new things coming out from young people. Uh, one of the things you can see is actually the number of companies that uh, went for listing in Bursa, uh, Bursa Kuala Lumpur uh, increased drastically in 2018 and increased even more in 2019. So there are new ideas, uh, new businesses. Even Rafizi is doing a startup. Uh, he's also uh, taking the plunge. The new ideas, but the, 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 the slice is very narrow, right? And, and, and the number of people who are doing it and benefiting from it is quite, quite small relative to the, to, to the size. But more worrying than that, if the economy is domesticating and we are not uh, uh, creating products and services that are only benchmarked to Malaysian demand, uh, clearly the, the, the competitiveness and the profitability of any uh, firms that operate at that basis when income is generally low is actually is quite thin. I mean, this is like micro one-on-one. -on -one. Like you have your, your cost curve like this, right? If your, 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 your market is so small, you're operating at the less optimum part of your cost curve, assuming your cost curve is the, most, the best technology you can choose. So the lower, the, the somewhat unequal income distribution and the generally low income levels does not, and the domestication of the economy, does, it's not good for firms to come up because then margins and actually uh, markets size are actually quite uh, constrained by those sort of things. So actually, that's one of the uh, worries about low, medium uh, income, median income and uh, domesticating economy. It's actually the new stories, the new firms that can come in are somewhat constrained by those things in very, very, very severe, uh, severely. Now, in terms of the external environment, uh, we know the story we've heard about from all the speakers today in terms of US, China, and all these things. Domestic, uh, domestic issues by way of the economy has all to do with uh, the political things. Because if there's no clear political succession, there's no clarity on what is the long-term uh, policy uh, regime, and therefore, what are the regulatory uh, regime that is derived from those policies? So, and and I, and I think uh, uh, those uncertainties are somewhat related. So, if the issues that Rafizi have said uh, are being sorted out, I think we are okay. <laughs> now, in terms of uh, some of the outlook, I, I, I happen to think that. Uh, 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 sequence because time of, is of the essence, right? So Rafizi said it's not this year, it's early next year or first half of next year. But the problem is time is moving. So time is, is of the essence. And somebody said, uh, you know, the fixed cost of doing something and the fixed cost of not doing anything is the same. I mean, it might be different, but it's the same. You have a fixed cost of not doing anything, you also have a fixed cost of doing something. Now, if we don't start doing some of the more difficult, politically difficult things uh, because we have to be, uh, somebody from uh, uh, Thailand mentioned, because you have to be popular and, 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 and refrain from doing the difficult part. The difficult part gets to be more difficult as time uh, passes. So I'm, uh, I think as an economist, just purely as an economist, I think some of those difficult things needs to be done and needs to be addressed. Otherwise, uh, it gets to be more and more and more difficult. Um, this thing about sub subsidies is very difficult, to, very difficult, politically difficult to do. This thing about this whole uh, boomy uh, agenda is very difficult thing to do, but it has, uh, it's, it's necessary to, to, to do. Otherwise, we, we cannot move along the economic trajectory that we, 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 we want to. But uh, there are things that are technically difficult to do. There are things that are politically difficult to do. And then I hate this word, uh, low-hanging low fruits. If you keep on harvesting the low-hanging fruits, uh, you, you're not going to do much, actually. That's what happened to countries who don't do things who keep on harvesting low-hanging fruits, they will end up with uh, a lousy tree, actually, at the end of it. Uh, <laughs> that's consultant talk, you know, this low-hanging fruit thing.
Now, the last bit is actually uh, any upside on this thing, any upside. I, I happen to think, and this is perhaps the, the right forum to advocate this, I happen to think that actually th this it used to be that I believe that we live in the land of giants, that actually there was this emergence of uh, continental economies, you know, North America, China, Brazil, India, uh, and then you got small countries, and then even Indonesia actually, and then you got small countries like us. Uh, and, and there was a time not too long ago when everything was honky dory and the economy was growing, trade was growing, and I thought even then, the hedge against that for small countries like us is actually to get together in this regional uh, framework. But now, since they are starting to scratch each, at each other, I think the same solution still holds. So the upside for the region is actually, um, uh, I think Mary, in the Indonesia case, showed that uh, Indonesia has 17 special economic zones. Uh, uh, but those are economic zones within Indonesia. Right? Malaysia also have its corridors within Malaysia. But we should do quite a bit more on this. I mean, Iskandar, Malaysia was an example of a Johor and Singapore kind of a thing. Uh, but we've had this Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand thing for the longest time that nothing really happened. We have this Bimiaga uh, on the Philippine side, which nothing much uh, really happens. But I think we ought to look at uh, some of this uh, regional uh, bilateral, not necessarily ASEAN thingy, but more of a bilateral or trilateral kind of a economic uh, cooperation or economic uh, zones as, 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 as an, an opportunity to do things. Now, I look at the demographic profile of Malaysia and compare it with ASEAN, just to tell an audience in Singapore, I think Singapore is, has an old profile. <laughs> Singapore's demographic profile is quite old, uh, much older than Malaysia, much older than uh, uh, Singapore's economic uh, demographic profile is a, like, a bit like Thailand. Um, but Malaysia and Indonesia has a very young demographic profile. And, and this youth and the needs of youth and the idealism of youth and the possibilities that come out of it. I've been to Indonesia and I think some of the youth there are really empowered and they should be doing things. That's uh, another thing. But I would like to end in somewhat of a somber thing by again reiterating that the biggest challenge politically as well as economically for Malaysia is the disparity in, in, in Malaysia that you see today. It might not be so apparent, but if you go on the ground, it is a serious problem of inequality. It is not just regional, it is not racial, it's actually life would be, politics would be more, I don't know whether it's easier, if it's going to be a class-based uh, politics rather than race-based politics, because the issue is really not race, but the issue is actually uh, between those who have and those who do not have. So with that, Francis, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nungsari. Um, I'm going to sneak in two quick questions, one to each of the, the presenters before we open for questions. Uh, so the first one, uh, YB Rafizi. In one word, or three words, Tansri Najib. So yesterday was a very exciting day in Malaysia. There was a lot of uh, discussion on the release of some audio clips. Um, does this mark the beginning of the end for his political career? And if so, depending on which way it goes, what are the implications for Pakatan Harapan in terms of boosting popularity, but also perhaps giving UMNO a new narrative that they're coming to the fore with a new type of leadership? So in the months ahead, eh, what can we see there? And then for Dr. Nungsari, um, you've talked about not really wanting to deal with or wanting to look beyond low-hanging fruit. Uh, one of the things that the Pakatan Harapan administration has begun to do is uh, progressively increase the minimum wage. Um, and so, I mean, there are various uh, policy objectives behind that. Number one is to, of course, increase income, deal with cost of living issues, and also, to a certain extent, encourage a move away from labor-intensive operations to more skill-intensive operations. However, of course, the counter-argument is that this will affect competitiveness. So could you share with us a little bit what your thinking is on this and, and what in the given in a year ahead you would uh, recommend for Pakatan Harapan to think about doing? Uh, please, Fajr. Uh, thanks, Francis. 
Um, before May 2018, I would be very careful to pass comments about Najib. He sued me many times. Um, uh, <laughs> I had 14 court cases, about seven relates to Najib. So. Um, yeah, I mean, to those who follow um, the Anti-Corruption Commission, yesterday released a series of audio recordings of Najib and the attempts to suppress the 1MDB and to cover up. Um, I don't know how Najib looks at his political career now. I, I have a feeling that he thinks that he's popular. Um, I hope he does not harbour any ambition to make a comeback. The reason being is, I think Amno is an institution. It is not loyal to any particular person. Amno survives until today on the one um, premise that for Malays in Malaysia to have a good life, it must have a strong Malay government. And so long that a significant number of, of Malay Malaysians believe like that, then Amno will always be relevant. Najib is somewhat popular in the last one year is because Najib had no choice. He was the only one who was willing to tour the country and did the kind of stupid things that he did. And in the absence of a strong narrative from Pakatan Harapan, whatever Najib did to ridicule Pakatan Harapan was considered popular because Najib was seen to be voicing up what the voters feel um, Pakatan Harapan was not de delivering. But it was not an endorsement of Najib's own popularity. If Najib, or to a certain extent, Amno leadership thinks that Malaysians at large do not understand 1MDB or forget of the um, scandals and the financial mess left by Najib, um, that would be their undoing because I think so-called popularity of Amno and Najib now, it's got nothing to do with Amno and Najib. It's because Pakatan Harapan is not seen to be delivering on election promises. That's why if Pakatan Harapan can very quickly focus on the economy and make things better, or at least give some semblance of pathway to something better that they promise, then very quickly, the same people who support Najib will swing to Pakatan Harapan. So as far as his political career is concerned, I don't know whether he's doing it because he wants to make a comeback, or to be frank, if we were to be in his shoes, what else do you expect him to do? He is fighting for his freedom. Um, the cases against him is, is you know, I mean, it's quite obvious, so it's a matter of time. So he will do whatever he can, basically, to stay free outside. Um, I've mentioned about Amno. Um, I don't think whatever happens to Najib will have a prolonged effect on Amno. If anything, I think Amno will um, enjoy the popularity out of Pakatan's weaknesses. But as in any other advantages that is not from your own strength, if you are popular because your opponent is unpopular, the moment your opponents begin to buck up and start having um, better performance, then you'll be in trouble. And I think that will be unknown in the next five to six years. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to Pakatan, it's about delivery. It's the same in Singapore, it's the same in Indonesia, in Thailand, anywhere in the world. Politicians can promise anything. At the end of the day, we are facing um, a younger population of voters, and they have this instant gratification attitude that I put you there, I expect things to happen. If it doesn't happen, I can say good things today, Tomorrow I can say bad things, because after all, it's Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'm free to say anything. So um, I run a lot of data analytics and uh, on Facebook, on social media, we do surveys and so on. Um, the swing of support is very fluid now. Uh, it can swing either way. So that's why to me, two years is a very long time in politics. Even one month is very long provided that any government focus on delivery and 
show some results, then I think they'll be fine. We'll have to switch there. I mean, uh, it, is, it is known that actually in Malaysia, the op aggregate share of uh, wages to total income is actually quite low. So therefore, it explains why, why uh, income is generally low. And it's low because, you know, we, we, I just looked it up some time ago. In, in, in when, when Felda was formed in 1960, there were 60, believe it or not, there were 60,000 hectares of palm oil. Of course, in 1960, as old as me. Uh, today, there's 6 million hectares of farm oil. That's, that's what we have done. And what is that? That is just adding land and a little bit of capital using cheap labor to generate returns to what? Mostly to capital, right? So that's why the share of labor to, to, to overall income is very low. Now, if you look at the three industries, three subsectors that actually uh, attract a lot of, a lot of capital, uh, it's actually it's on, in oil and gas, in, 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 in manufacturing, uh, and in services, which are actually not, not normal services, but actually in financial services. So those are the three sectors that are actually capital intensive in that sense. And those are the three sectors that actually pays a lot more than the other sectors. So capital intensity, which actually comes along with it, uh, the ability to handle capital and technology, which is actually then goes back to education. Like that's why education, if you want, if you ask me, the, the real solution to quite a bit of this thing is actually we need to really sort out our, our human capital issues, right? If we sort out the human capital issues, then the ability for firms and industries to, to be more capital intensive, more, cap, more technology incentive, uh, in, intensive is there. Then you resolve the, 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 uh, the low, low wages issue. Now, the minimum wage uh, would just sort of raise the water level for everyone, uh, which is, there's a whole lot of debate on that. I think the Pagatan Arapan Manifesto promises, uh, promised uh, 1,005. I think it's now at 1,100, uh, 1, I think, right now. Uh, of course, the, the employer sites are is making a lot of noise. But reprising labor, uh, at, at this, is one of the, this is one of those uh, things, right? The tough decisions that we need to make. I think Singapore did this like, I don't know, 40, 30 years ago, totally rebase, reprice, and uh, mix, get out of certain uh, sectors and move on. But you, you had a fantastic uh, human capital education system to drive that. And if you ask me, I think that that's where we failed the last, whatever, 40, 50 years ago. So, good luck to the politicians. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll take a couple of, of quick questions. The light is in our eyes, so please do uh, wave our hand, uh, your hand. Yes, please, ma'am. Mm. Actually, I have two questions. I'm Chen Hing Chi, and I'm from ICES. Uh, the first question is a simple one. It's for both speakers. You know, you can answer the, the two questions. The first is this. With the U.S.-China trade war and the discussion about the diversion of the supply chain. Malaysia is also mentioned as one country benefiting from this and going to Penang. Our Vietnamese speaker this morning said, no, it didn't do much for the economy. So my question is, is the diversion real and uh, has it affected the Malaysian economy? My second question has to do with domestication of the economy that Dr. Umsari spoke of. Uh, in Southeast Asian countries now, we see there is um, certainly in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and in uh, the Philippines, bubbling startups. And they usually work because market is big, needs are great, and so it gives a lot of opportunities for startups to come into the space. And I think you're in a startup space, Mr. Rafizi. What, I don't get the sense that in Malaysia there's this bubble. Uh, why is it? And what is stopping it? Thank you very much. And I think uh, YB, please. Thank you, Fr Francis. Um, two quick questions, too. Uh, but before that, thank you, Rafizi and Dr. Musari, for sure sharing and for being very candid. Uh, my two questions, uh, I think we all know that, I think you know that we wish well for Malaysia, 
So I just like to ask this very awkward question. We all know Mahathir is uh, Dr. Mahathir is 95, and we wish him long life. But uh, what if, for health or other reasons, that he has to step down? What will happen? Will it expedite the breakup of Harapan, or will Harapan actually rally to a possible succession? I mean, I suppose it'd be Anwar. Second question is about the race and religion axis. What will it take for Malaysia to realize that the race and religion cannot be a sustainable formula for the harmonious and prosperous Malaysia? It cannot be that low-hanging fruit. So what will it take? More race riots? or other issues that will emerge, like what Dr. Nongsari mentioned about the inequality, regardless of race, language, and religion. What will it be for Malaysia's most stable econo uh, political uh, way forward, not political expediency? Thank you. So we have two economic-related questions and two political questions. I'll reverse the order, and I'll uh, ask Dr. Nongsari to take the two economic-related questions first. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the domestication and, and um, entrepreneurial spirit and market size and, and startups. Uh, I have uh, somebody asked me this same question about a year ago, more than a year ago, right at the change of when the, when the euphoria was there. And then somebody asked me, and I said, Actually, the government should just chill out, you know, and, and chill out, relax. And, and, you know, it's not that the government has lots of money anyway. It's in deficit. So uh, just open up the space, let people try things out. And, and the money is there. Uh, it's one thing in Malaysia, the money is there. <laughs> there are people with money. There are comp companies' balance sheets are okay. It's just the government's balance sheet is kind of crap, but actually uh, there are households <laughs> with, with lots of uh, healthy balance sheets and there are lots of companies with healthy balance sheets. So capital is not the issue. The issues are ideas and, and energy. And I'm one of those who believe that, you know, at this age, no, but if I'm 25 years old, if I'm 20 years old, if I'm under 30, I'll be totally reckless about what, I, what I'll do. I, I, I don't think we have a short supply of those people. It's just that the, you have to have a sense of uh, can do, you know, I can fail. Uh, then then uh, the entrepreneurial thing will, will come about. Now, people have been saying that uh, risk capital is not available in Malaysia, you know, it's too dependent on, on the capital market, the financial system. But I don't think that is true. There's a lot of young people who are doing um, a lot of new things. And there's a lot of people who are willing to bet on these young people. Of course, you cannot judge by those who go to the capital market because those are already uh, up to a certain level. But the euphoria, the sense of can do. But I've seen enough young people doing new things that I'm actually quite, quite okay. It's just that I think the scale is not there. So in terms of the China, uh, US-China thing, Penang, uh, I'm, I'm from Penang. I, I, it's not quite happening yet, the, 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 the benefiting uh, the, the, the geographical relocation along the supply chain, so to speak, from from China to to other parts. Maybe maybe in, in Vietnam is looking a lot better than in in, in Malaysia, but uh, I, I've not seen that yet because I think the first wave is more on the financial uh, capital market side. The second wave on the real economy, I've not really seen that. On the first wave, we we are not a beneficiary to that. I mean, Malaysia is not a beneficiary. Maybe Singapore is a beneficiary to that <laughs> for the first wave. <laughs> Thank you. Um, YB? Um, I know that there were two economic questions and two um, political questions. Um, being politicians or former politicians, both of us were former, former politicians anyway, so we like to butt in things that are not related to it. So I, I still want to answer a bit about startup because that's, that's, that's what I chose to do after politics, you know. Um, the, my own experience running um, my own startup now, we have about 80 plus people, um, is that talent is a problem. 
and it's not just a problem in Malaysia, it's, it's a problem in Singapore, it's a problem even in Indonesia. Prof Mari was talking about Gojek having to buy over a Bangalore company. Uh, just to give a, a perspective, um, we have about 20 public universities with computer science faculties. So total production of software engineers every year is if you take like one, one university, one faculty producing about 200. So you're looking at 6,000 people per year. So even if you have reached a certain scale, a certain stage, when you want to innovate and do things yourself, talent is a problem. And, um, and, and that's something where unless we um, fix uh, the disconnect between the public education, the higher education, and how fast the economy around the world is moving, then, then you know, startup will remain a euphoria. Having said that, um, since you know, I'm, I spend most of my time doing tech and startup nowadays, the biggest problem is here, more than anything else. You know, to, to a certain extent, what Dr. Nunsari said. Um, I, I, I used to tell this to smaller groups. Like in Silicon Valley, you are told that um, uh, fail fast and fail as often as possible because uh, startup and tech is all about it iteration. You, know, you, you do something, you iterate, and then the sooner you fail, the sooner you learn, the more resilient you are. Uh, that kind of culture and thinking is not in Malaysia. And I suppose it's not generally, it's not Asian. Asian, not just unique to Malaysia, Asians are not taught to be a failure, in, especially in the beginning of your career. If you go to Stanford and come back and tell your parents that, you know what, I want to do my startup and I just burn 200,000 and it's bankrupt, you know. Um, it's something that our culture does not tolerate. Unfortunately for us, that's just how tech and startup work. So there needs to be a shift in how society generally looks at economy and startup and tech. That if I were a policymaker, I would rather see more young, smart people taking a plunge and fail earlier on so that they can be better after two or three iterations. And there must be safety net public policy that at least support that a bit. That is not in Malaysia. And so, so part, some of us, I mean, that's a challenge I put to myself because I think we need as many success stories as possible. If there are enough people who prove it that, you know, we did it and it wasn't that difficult, it could be done, then you can start pushing for more people to take the plunge. So that's the situation in Malaysia now. And if you look at the number of term sheets issued for seed investments or Series A or Series B, um, Malaysia is way behind. We are at the level of almost the same as Philippines, Thailand. We, I think we are behind Vietnam. There's more term sheets. Obviously, the highest number of term sheets issues are for Singapore, and then Indonesia, and then Vietnam. So given the maturity or the advanced stage comparatively of our economy and education, you would expect Malaysia to be in the top three at least. You know? so, there's a long way to go, but I think um, independent of what the government or the economy is doing, um, most, most of it is out of need. I think more and more people realise that that's just the way to go. Malaysia or Singapore for that matter cannot, can no longer see ourselves as a nation because we are small. I mean, it's like there's only 30 million market in Malaysia, 4 million, 5 million in Singapore. We need to harness the fact that we are sitting on a 600 million market. And um, to, if you want to go with Professor Mari's uh, extension, it's even bigger. If you start including India and China, you are looking at a third of the world's market here. And the more people realize that, and I think you will see more people plunging into tech and startup, because the scaling up to that 600 million market is, is a lot easier. Um, the question on Mahathir's health is the easiest to answer. Um, I wish him well, but if things don't turn out well, health-wise for him, uh, I think it will be a smooth transition in, in Pakatan um, because there's no issue about um, 
Anwar's support from Pakatan and from among the MPs, the issue is whether Tun Mahathir wants to relinquish or not. So if he relinquished willingly, the transition is actually going to be very smooth. And this is where I think uh, at some point the common sense will prevail because the four parties in Pakatan will realize the sooner the transition happens, the sooner they can start preparing for the next general election. So um, it's, it's kind of odd because you have to wish him well, but everyone knows quietly the opposite. You know? um, yeah, I mean, you interpret however you wish to interpret that. Um, and the last question, uh, race and religion. Um, this is where a lot of people may disagree with me, but I think it has to be bad before it gets better. Um, you can't deconstruct a 60 years of mindset and indoctrination and divide um, within a term. Um, most Malaysians point fingers at each other. The non-Malays feel that whatever they are, they always are considered second-class citizen and they point fingers at Malays. Malays always feel that whatever they are is because the non-Malays steal from them. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult for us to um, combat that narrative now, but as is with the things in the world, usually social economic changes usher a change in mindset much quicker than political changes do. So whether we like it or not, although the narratives of the extreme Malay, Islam, ethnocentric um, narrative now is gaining ground, and in all likelihood, to be frank, it will see a change of government in the next general election. You will see for the first time an ultra uh, right-wing Malay Muslim government in Malaysia, which with very little representation uh, from the non-Malays. But I think what will happen after that is that things don't get better. Economically, things get worse. Um, the same problem that beset Pakatan or Barisan's na national governments before that, the underemployment, the wages and so on, will continue. And that may be the turning point when enough Malays will realize that, hang on, it's not about the government. It doesn't matter who control the governments, whether it's Chinese or Indian or Malay, at the end of the day, it's about how we are competitively. If we can't compete and we can't rise up to the level that is needed for us to compete in this world, Malays won't have enough from the economic pie generated by the government to sustain the kind of economic dreams that they have. And I think that will be the most effective lessons to manage and settle the race religion um, problem. Thank you very much. Lamentably, we are out of time. Um, so we will draw this panel to a close. Uh, what I've really enjoyed about uh, this panel is that we have done what Dr. Nongsari has advocated. We have avoided harvesting the low-hanging fruits and instead we've focused on much deeper issues, particularly leadership transition, as well as some of the key ingredients for the structural transformation, transformation of the Malaysian economy. So with this, uh, I will conclude. Please join me in thanking our two panelists. Thank you.